So some may have heard a bit about it, some may not. So we just want to give a brief overview of what this project is. Um, then we'll look at the Tapuru specific details and how to provide feedback. And like I said, there will be questions and there will be um, points at which um, we'll go through the chat and pick out the questions and Connie will read them out for me and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so why are we doing a shoreline management plan? That's, that's often the first question. Um, particularly in Tapuru or living on the Thames coast, you'll be probably aware of the 2018 event and the significant erosion and flooding that's happened in, in recent times. Um, so that's a big part of why we're uh, doing this project, uh, the flooding that occurs. The other thing that we're looking at is coastal erosion. So uh, inundation and erosion are the two hazards um, that we're looking at uh, most closely for this project. And those are related to the coastal aspects of erosion and inundation. Um, how we're doing it is we're following the MEC process. Uh, uh, Ministry for Environment put out a document that talks about how you should do this type of work. A big part of it is understanding the hazards. Um, and so that's where you start. Uh, we've done a lot of work to understand the hazards. But next, you know, have to understand what's important to people, what's at risk. What's, it, what's vulnerable, um, and then you start thinking about pathways or options to uh, address those issues or how to best manage them. In terms, in terms of who, um, we've got a project team that has uh, Waka Kotahi involved, Waikato Regional Council involved, and that's the, and the consultants for all Haskoning. Um, so that's, that's kind of the technical team who work alongside TCDC staff. Um, to do a lot of the technical work, um, but the projects are quite a bit bigger than that. Um, at the top, you've got a governance group, and that's representatives of council. Um, so four representatives there from council and iwi representatives there as well. Um, the people that do the most work, and I'll just go to our next slide, hopefully. People that do the most work are actually our coastal panels. And so, uh, very, very small box down the bottom. Um, because this pro project is so big, it covers 400 kilometres around the whole of the district. It's been broken up to four areas. And so there's four coastal panels for each area. And so they get a chance to look at all the hazard information, the technical information, understand what the values are, and start to work through the solutions with support from um, the technical team and uh, Waikato Regional Council and, and others. And so, so that's where the plans are developed and then they go through a process to have them recommended to council. Um, so I've skipped through to a, a, another slide. This, this was uh, a kind of snapshot of what we did earlier on in the process, probably going back a year and a half or two years, and that is understanding the values. Um, so for the district access um, to properties to the beach comes out really highly, um, and that's understandable given the challenges of State Highway over recent times, but also the environment and the, the beaches are pretty important. Um, it's worth noting that it's uh, as much as possible, and a lot of effort has gone on into making it a community-led process. So as well as having those coastal panels, I think we're up to the, the kind of fifth consultation event where we're getting direct feedback from um, community um, from the community, and that's influencing how we look at the hazards and what uh, solutions we may recommend. So what are what are the hazards? So this this is just outside of the Peru. It's uh, Thames. Um, the hazards shown here uh, are largely inundation, um, and so. A hazard uh, may not be a problem until you start considering um, what's exposed by that, that hazard and how vulnerable it is. So if you've got houses or roads that are uh, damaged by a, or flooded, um, that might be a significant risk, uh, where, whereas if it was a sports field or a public reserve, that might be a lower level of risk. So as well as understanding um, the flooding inundation, there's also been a lot of work gone on to understand the risk associated with that um, flooding or those hazards. 
Um, I've got a bit more coming in terms of um, the hazards, but I'll just pause there to allow for any questions. And I'm thinking about questions um, on the project itself, so that the project that, that, that will last three years, the project that covers 400 kilometres, and it's got the governance structure that I've just talked about. Um, if there are any questions on that, Connie, happy to um, try and answer those. Thanks, Simon. We don't have any um, questions at the moment. Just a comment from one participant who's keen to see a balanced view um, versus a worst case scenario. So really, I guess, just looking for an understanding of how you've arrived at the modelling that we have arrived at um, and, and wanting people to understand that there's still an opportunity to reduce the effects of climate change and sea level rise is that person's perspective. So looking for a balanced view rather than an alarmist one. Thank you. That's that's a good comment. Um, so in terms of the hazard, and I think I'm going to come to sea level rise quite soon um, and talk about that, um, a lot of what we've shown has been 1% uh, or 100 year, 1% AETs, which is actually 100 year events. So there are events that aren't expected to happen often. They're quite extreme, um, but they do happen. And there's, there's in Tapu been cases recently where some of the events align with some of the, the modelling quite closely. But other aspect which this person has kind of highlighted is the sea level rise. Um, so it's not just about what has exist today, but also we need to think about how sea level rise is going to impact, impact uh, on the uh, inundation events and also the erosion events. So what you're seeing on the left is a, a hazard map for a 1% or a 100 year uh, storm, but the colour code down the body, bottom shows the sea level rise increment. So the blue area is what could be exposed now in a, in a large event. And then you go through to a pink, green, and probably a purple and an orange area. So those are all sea level rise scenarios. Um, worth noting that the, the blue area, although it won't be any more um, inundation in that area or the extent of an inundation, it doesn't change as sea level rise happens or is predicted to happen, those events will become more frequent and the, the depth or the impact of flooding would, would be um, higher. Um, so sea level rise and recognise that there is uncertainty with sea level rise and, and that's what the, the comment previously was highlighting. Um, there's a lot of work, um, scientific um, work going on to predict um, what those uh, sea level rise scenarios look like. Um, and so looking out 100 years, we're potentially looking at 1.4 metres of sea level rise, but there's really quite a range uh, in terms of predictions. Um, those predictions are updated quite frequently. Um, and as recently as the last month, another iteration of predictions has come out. Um, unfortunately, they're not going things as, as getting better. Um, and I wouldn't be able to say how much worse they are without um, kind of taking the time to digest those reports. Um, but yeah, the, the conservative approach, even though it could be considered alarmist, appears to be uh, where we're heading um, for now anyway. Um, the other aspect to the uncertainty is although we uh, consider a range of events, um, we also allow in our planning um, a, an adaptation process, uh, whereas if the, the worst case scenario doesn't happen, then potentially we don't need to implement things um, that we would if there was was more risk. Um, so in, in Tapuru, uh, mentioned that there's uh, that the flood inundation hazard maps on the left and how those 1% storms look and the various sea level rise scenarios. Uh, but also just wanting to highlight that it's not just about inundation for a Tapuru, there's also some uh, erosion risk as, as well. Um, 
which which complicates things just a little. So, so I hopefully can hand over to Rick without too much difficulty, because um, we acknowledge that the work we're doing is focused on the coast, it's shoreline management plan work, uh, but there are other hazards, and particularly in Tapu, um, there's the river, river hazard, but there's also uh, protection in place to help with that. Um, over to you, Rick. I'll um, push through the slides as as and when you indicate. Great, thank you very much, Amon, and uh, Kira Koto to everyone out there uh, in Tipuru and, and elsewhere. So, just to introduce myself. So, Rick Leafting, I'm team leader of regional resilience at Waikato Regional Council. Uh, our our team deals with flood uh, assessing flood protection in terms of its performance. Uh, and also we also become involved with flood response as well. So if you can just do the next slide, please, Amon. So I've taken these next, these, I've only got two slides, these two slides here from our, uh, our Waikato Regional Hazards Portal. Uh, and I've got a link in into the chat there that'll take you to that. So you can see this online yourself as well. So this is our uh, under our flood management tab. And you can see the, uh, and if I, use my cursor, I hope you can see my cursor, you can see the, the WRC flood protection here and these red lines here, which are the, and I'm sure you know this, uh, these are the, the flood walls that are erected there and we have a uh, more of an earthen bund stop bank here on the side through here. Now, this flood protection here is there to protect the majority of Tipuru from a 1% AEP, which is equivalent to a 100 year uh, rainfall event that occurs within the Tipuru catchment and flows down this river here. Um, those blue and white dots there, they are they are floodgates as well. So the we call that the design flood level. So the design flood level of this scheme here is your 1% AEP annual acceptability, uh, which is equivalent to your 100 year um, average return interval. Now that's the design crest level. We also have another 600 millimeters on top of that that brings you up to your, I say that's your design flood level, and then we add another 600 millimetres to get you your design crest level. So the tops of those uh, flood protection uh, assets are your 1% AAP flood plus another 600 millimetres. So that extra 600 millimetres is there to account for any uncertainty in the modelling that we've done to come up with that design flood level, but it can also allow for some um, you know, some potential future climate change as well from rainfall falling in the catchment. Uh, next slide, please, Amon, last slide. Uh, and just to provide a, a bit of an indication, uh, that blue area there is the general area that is protected by uh, that Regional Council flood protection. So um, you can see there that it offers quite considerable protection for, for much of Tipuru from a river event uh, of the Tipuru um, stream river. So um, that's about it. I'm happy to, to, you know, to, to uh, answer any questions that come through the comments, um, but anything else that I need to add, add to? So in terms of the, the, the payment for the scheme, uh, the, the scheme has, has been uh, funded through the Peninsula Project. Uh, it came about from the 2002 weather bomb, uh, which um, you can sort of see a, a light blue line on that image there, which shows the extent, the flooding extent in 2002. Uh, and from there, it is a uh, um, the the inception of the modelling and the funding regime, and the, and the scheme was built in the early 2010s. So I see there is a question that's come through there, um, Connie. Have a look at that. Sure thing. Thanks, Rick. Mm. Um, so this question is or comment is that TCDC seems to like spending a lot of time and money looking at theoretical levels via prediction models that are not um, necessarily fact, according to this comment. Um, and they are referring to the 2009 TCDC report based on facts and actual stats, they say, um, for Coromandel beaches. And this report was called Coastal Hazards Review of Primary Development Setback at Selected Beaches Prepared for Thames Coromandel District Council. Um, and just noting that the information in that report is significantly different to the levels that we are showing this evening. So that, that's a comment relating to a report 11, 11 years ago, 2009, Connie, correct. is that right? Yep, correct. Um, 
Pat, so thank you for um, highlighting that that report exists. We have done a review of previous reports. Um, I'm very confident that's been part of the review, but it, it's good just to consider um, that there are other reports out there. Um, and yes, there are differences over time and what people are predicting. I think uh, Tapuru's one that has a bit more um, on the ground um, instances of calibration that we can gain confidence um, in terms of our, our flooding extents. Um, so that's that's a good thing from one perspective. It's not, not ideal that there have been floods there, but um, it does allow us to to check what our theoretical models are, are showing. Um, so the, the next part of the presentation is, is talking about what it would take to protect. And it's, it's not really um, focused, or, or we, we need to put that in context. Um, we have done some work in terms of understanding whether or not it's feasible and at a high level what the likely cost would be of protecting Tupuru. Um, this isn't for the purposes of building something. It's not a detailed design. Uh, the costs associated with those are not, not going to be accurate and there's going to be things that are missing or things that we have over included or not included. And so we've been consistent across the district because there's been about eight or nine different locations where we've, we've done this type of feasibility work. Um, we've, we've looked out 100 years into the future and we've looked at a 1% or a 100, 1 in 100 year event. Um, so we haven't looked at um, how that might be staged in detail, uh, but we've taken that information to uh, and put it in front of our coastal panels um, to understand how we may or may not um, protect different areas over over the long term. Um, there's quite a, a conservative approach in terms of to the in terms of the design, um, but one thing that's not in there is the freeboard that that Rick talked about. So there is, there is wave run up and other things that um, could be considered conservative, but there isn't an additional 600 mils on top of that. So you could strip out some of those um, wave run up assumptions and add freeboard instead. That's just a different, different approach, um, but that's how we've done it for the feasibility um, point of view. So what that might look like, um, so for Tupuru, um, it indicates a height of 6.2, it's important to know that that's not actually a height, that's that's a level. And so when you're thinking about how high a protection scheme might need to be, um, the, the level relative to the ground um, is something to consider. So it's probably a three and a half metre level if you're looking at sea view AV or slightly less if it's relative to, to Pudu school. So still a significantly high embankment or flood wall, um, but given that this is what's required in a hundred years in a hundred year event, um, not surprising that it's that it's very high, um, and it's not something we would advocate doing today in any extent because it's not required. We have not had the anticipated sea level rise to warrant this type of protection at this stage. Um, I did did have it in my uh, notes in terms of at a high level, there's two and a half kilometres required, um, two pump stations, and um, approximately $115 million of cost. Um, so. Hopefully that gives you some perspective that we've, we've looked at protection um, and that's gone into our thinking about what might need to happen for Tupuru. Are there any questions relating to those hazard aspects and protection mm -hmm. feasibility? There is, I'll just help this person that's just joined mute their microphone. Um, so just to follow up on the previous comment about the report, our coastal scientist Jamie has um, given some context around what that was. And I just remind everybody that the comments that you make in the chat 
Um, it's great to leave your comments and your thoughts there because they will be recorded and they will be input um, into our feedback, um, regardless of whether I get a chance to read them all out or not. So if you do leave a comment or you have thoughts there, please do continue to leave them in the thread. Um, we do have a question just about your previous slide, Eamon, somebody looking for clarification on the drawing. Um, what was that drawing referring to, the blue line from the previous page? So I'm not sure if you can clarify which blue line is, if we're on the right. Ah, this one I think is probably what you're talking about. Yeah, so the, the blue line um, um, represents the extent of protection that will be required. So from a coastal perspective, the protection would have to um, butt into or join up with the river protection. Um, and then it would need to go virtually all the way around to the state highway. Um, where it's blue, it's indicated from a kind of conceptual purpose that there is room to do an embankment. Where it's um, green, um, that's really saying that there's not a lot of room. Um, we haven't gone much further than that and looked at, say, say you might have a, an embankment that has a wall on one side, so you might might be able to have more embankment and less wall. Um, but because it's just to get a conceptual understanding of what's possible, that's as far as we've gone with the kind of us assuming what would be in place. And then what you have here is a visualisation of that embankment. So it has uh, pro probably a pretty uniform height or level at the top, um, but the height along the length would vary depending on existing ground levels. So hopefully that clarifies things a little bit, a little bit. We do have a question, Eamon, about the costs related to that. Um, um, just really, the, the question is why are the costs so excessive? Um, just referring to there being, um, Sorry, I'm just reading the question as, as I'm talking to you. It says 115 million, but the Waikato Regional Council has done the river protection for a number of areas, Tararu, Te Puru, Waiomu, Tapu, for less than 5 million. Can we get them to build it um, as how is your cost over 25 times for just Te Puru? The Waikato Regional Council is also upgrading 14 kilometres of the foreshore banks to double the width for 3 million. So the question is around around how we've arrived at those costs. Um, probably I can talk about relative to those four short stop banks. Um, one of the good things with some of the Waikato Regional Council assets, and Rick would, would probably uh, chime in as, as well as I can, is that they have um, sediment sources very close to their stop banks. So that they have... Um, borrow pits or um, sediment drains that they can literally dig out in a, every 10 years and place onto the stop bank. So they do not have to cart, in a lot of instances, material from A to B. Um, what we've used to cost this works is, is standard unit unit rates. So what, what does it cost to cart in a cubic metre of material? How much does it cost to build concrete walls? Um, so it's more of a quantity survey as approach to assessing the costs. Um, so a difference in methodology, but I'd also say um, when you get uh, to some of these heights we're talking about, um, the costs are, are ramp, ramp up. So a, a, a two metre wall costs uh, doesn't cost double or one metre more. There's, there's foundations and, and other things that actually create exponential cost to that. Um, ideally, um, we, our costs would be cheaper, um, but there's also things like consenting aspects that come into play. So a new um, flood protection scheme or a, a scheme that's in the coastal environment will have additional challenges um, compared to an existing one or one that was built 10, 20 years ago. Um, and I, just for comparative um, aspects, so that is, that is one thing that's good about this process is even though there'll be uh, variations in, in costs or um, 
over costs, under costs, uh, they've all been done in a consistent way across the district. So relatively, they're pretty good. Um, the, the team's cost is in the mid 200 million. Um, the Fidianga cost is slightly higher than that, um, pushing towards 300. And the Moana Tyree is $25 million. Um, so those are really high level costs. Shouldn't be assumed to be what things will actually cost, but that gives everyone a, a sense of the size of the challenge and how uh, challenging each of the areas are relative to each other. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's that's given a bit more insight into the cost. There would be needing to be more detailed design options assessment if we were to go down that um, protection option. Um, and cost would, would change at that point. Hopefully they would go down as you're suggesting, but often they don't, they go up. Thanks, Eamon. We do have one more question um, asking, is there no solution yet proposed for the green? So I'm assuming that's referring to the slide that we would, yes, correct. Uh, that green area is where we've said there's not enough room for an embankment and some type of wall would be required. So that, that could be where the houses are pretty close to the coastal environment. Um, that's probably the most likely scenario, or at the very edges, there could be the, the road as well that's really close. Thanks very much. We don't have any further questions at the moment, but um, do feel free as Eamon is talking through the next section. If you think of a question, just pop it in there and we'll make sure he gets a chance to answer it. Thanks, Eamon. Thank you, Connie. Um, so we have an understanding of the coastal hazards and the importance of um, the protection to houses and how flooding has eventuated in the past. And then as a group, we've moved on to what the solutions might be. Um, not as easy as having a single solution. So that example that we talked about in the feasibility study is a, a single solution in 100 years time. Um, that wouldn't be um, what you do. You'd look at a number of solutions or different solutions over different periods of time. And so that's what the pathway we're showing at the bottom is, is those different solutions. It's a, a little bit hard to follow, but I'll talk you through it and I'll kind of pause for questions on it. Um, so starting with flooding or coastal inundation, um, this area south, of Tupuru or Tupuru South um, has been identified through the coastal panel um, and through um, um, visual um, actual events that there are a number of low points. Um, so the boat ramp, for example, and along the coastal front, there are there are points that are low, and there is some um, by looking at those low points and um, doing something with the boat ramp that could reduce the impact of, of flooding. Um, so the second line that we've got there, it says new short-term defences where there is no existing coastal protection. Um, the creation of a beach bridge or storm bunt at high water with cliff or river material. So that's what the coastal panel and the project team at the moment is, is advocating for that, that short-term period. Um, however, when, from a flooding perspective, when that gets to 0.2 uh, metres sea level rise, um, we don't think that will be enough. So um, just filling in the boat ramp and doing some minor bunding uh, might, will definitely be inexpensive relative to, to the 115 million in terms of that 100 year protection in the 100 years, um, but it won't be enough to protect for that period as well. So at that point, um, we are suggesting we could look to uh, a new seawall that could be built in phases. So not a hundred year level of protection, um, but something in the increments of 0.4, perhaps 0.4 metres high. Um, and then as you get to that 0.4 metres high, we, we think there's another point where you've got a difficult or well, we've got a difficult decision um, and this is part of the point of having this meeting to get feedback on what that decision is 
as we start progressing towards that new seawall, that 100 year type protection scenario. Um, so significant cost, significant um, um, environmental or um, amenity impacts, um, but protecting uh, Tapuru. The alternative is as we get to that point four scenario, we actually start thinking about relocating um, away or the, the inundation risk to the houses becomes um, not bearable. Um, so talked about uh, flooding there, just flooding. Um, and when you start to try and put timeframes on it, um, you can, you can look at those those charts and I can, I will mention what those are. But also just first want to mention that even though we're planning um, for these scenarios, if there wasn't 0.2 metres of sea level rise or there wasn't 0.4, um, we may not have to implement those those um, options. So ideally, we, we only ever get 0.1 or 0.2 sea level rise, and we never actually have to um, build anything significant to protect the Peru. And I think um, the earlier comment about being alarmist, um, it's not so much um, having that adaptive approach with triggers means that we can plan for the worst, and if it is a lot better than that, um, we can uh, be happy and not have to implement some of the more expensive things. Um, there's a little, uh, I guess they're footnotes, so where you see point, point 0.2 and point 0.4, there's a little uh, note that says 1 and 2, and that allows you to refer to the um, predicted time periods. So that's based on the RCP 8.5, so thinking back to that earlier graph, um, it's a little bit conservative, um, but it's what's being recommended to use in this type of process. So 24 years, 43 and 57. So 0.2 could be in 24 years, uh, 0.4 could be in 43, and that's when you look at having to make a decision about significant protection or not, um, or implementing, having implemented significant protection or not, um, and that kind of takes you through to the kind of long term, either protecting or uh, not protecting. So the coastal panels have uh, gone back and forth, thought about this really hard, um, but one of the things uh, where we've got to is we, will, we want more input from the community um, to help us decide, because we're showing two options here, not, not both of them are viable from a flood protection um, point of view, you can you wouldn't retreat and protect at the same time. So in the long term, it's quite a, a tricky uh, decision about about that. In the short term, we think there are some things to, that can be done to buy us time or reduce the risks. Um, but that's that's how it's looking. I will allow allow for a few questions um, now before we. Um, dig it a bit deeper, look at the, the northern and then come back to the erosion. Thanks, Eamon. Um, we have a number of comments and they do um, mirror some comments that we received last night. So I think that this person may have received some answers from you on these already, but it's good to have them recorded in this meeting chat as well. Um, another comment about how you've um, figured out costs for fill and so forth. Um, and then a question about the wave run up um, again, comparing to as as happened last night, comparing with Auckland's coastal adoption plan that included zero for the wave run up. Um, but it may be useful to give the explanation there again around the conservative nature um, of, of of what we've factored in. Um, and then the final question from that um, person is really just looking for confirmation that no decisions on retreat will be made until it gets to actual RCP 8.5 heights? Um, so the first one, I hopefully can hand over to Sean in terms of that wave run up. Um, we did have a kind of off, 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 off the record or a, a conversation, email exchange about it, um, but I wouldn't be able to explain it as well as her. Are you able to do that, Sean? Hi, Awan, yes. Um, so there's a number of points to consider. 
Um, one is that uh, these predictions are, that, that we're showing you here are based on a 100-year event in 100 years, potentially. So we're looking at a, a significant potential effect. So we've been quite precautionary. And on that basis, the wave runner and setup and storm surge calculations have been cautious. So because it's better to prepare for the worst, uh, be ready for the worst, and then realize realize the best. So not not to have to um, or not to have any damage occur um, because you've managed it. The other thing saying it, to worth saying is that we looked at the January 2018 storm event, and our modeling um, calculations for wave setup and run up were based on the events and the levels of water that were recorded during those during that storm. And finally, the other thing we've done is uh, the work, the modeling work has been peer reviewed by NIWA, by the University of uh, Auckland specialists who have looked at the storm events and the uh, storm surge and wave setup and run up calculations that we've used. So we've been as thorough as we can be while being precautionary in what we're doing. Thanks very Thanks. much, Sharon. Um, Eamon, it may just be worth revisiting that final um, question just around um, how decisions on retreat will be made. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting one. So we um, will look to have this adopted through the governance committee and the project has about four months to run all going well and um, we'll have another round of uh, probably it'll be our seventh round of public consultation to support um, where the pathways end up um, but there will need to be more work um, done on on those triggers so what's indicated here um, at the moment and this is where the, the feedback is very useful is, is we're going to plan for retreat but not actually implement retreat in terms of um, the need to relocate houses and such until you get to the 0.4 um, level. So that's when the threshold we believe is, is not acceptable. Um, how we plan for, for retreat is going to take a lot, lot more work. Um, there, are, there is a range of approaches to planning um, for retreat. Um, and at one extreme, it is um, very little management of the retreat. So there could be the sharing of hazard information. Um, and so people are aware in terms of what the risks are to their property or when they purchase property. Um, and we could do very little else. Um, you go a step further, um, you could support uh, relocation, so where people do want to move, um, that that could be supported by purchases. Alongside that, you're likely to have actual flood events that could cause people to decide to, to move or, or raise their floor levels or do other things, and insurance aspects. Um, if you get a number of floods, your ability to get insurance um, might help you decide either to or to, to not move to there. And at the very extreme, you've got the scenario where it's not safe for people to be. Um, a lot of lot of the hazards we've looked at, um, um, I'm sure there'd be exceptions. Um, there, there, there would be uh, damage to properties, um, but not hopefully and not anticipating um, storms that would cause uh, a risk to life. One of the reasons I do say that is that the predictability of the high tide and the storms does allow other mechanisms to be in, put in place to reduce risk. Um, so, so when we're talking about relocation, um, there's a range um, of how that might happen and there would need to be work done on, on, on that relocation. How, and we, have, we haven't done the work um, to say how we're going to approach that. Um, but adoption of the plan will, will let us know, actually, we need to put our effort into 
um, possibly in this area, short-term defences to make sure there's reduced risk. And then after those um, serve a purpose, the focus may turn to either a, a comprehensive flood protection or for how to support that managed retreat. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I, I said quite a, a lot of words, but hopefully they, they helped inform that. I, I will go to the next one, which is to Peru North, and just talk a little bit more about the flooding aspects before we come back, and I'll hand over to Sean to touch on the, the erosion. And so to Peru North, um, so the, the good thing about this, or the thing that um, has been expressed a little bit from the coastal panel is this area doesn't have the holes, uh, I call them holes, but things like the boat ramp and areas that water can overtop those, those natural defences, we'll, we'll call them. Um, so there isn't necessarily a need to um, do the short-term fixes in the northern area. However, once you get up to point two, uh, an incremental sea, uh, sea wall or bunding of four point uh, 0.4 might be desirable. And then again, from a flooding perspective, the choice uh, up at 0.4 metres is around um, a full full wall uh, that, that is expensive as per the uh, feasibility or the relocation. Um, so similar to the south, except for the, the there aren't the, the holes from a flood perspective. Um, so both the north and south are very much uh, overshadowed um, by the flooding challenges. So the, the flooding challenges uh, go significantly more through to Peru um, than the erosion lines. Um, and I'm, I'm am talking, well, long term, but also there is as, um, some risk today, as you people would have known from um, recent events. Um, but erosion is another aspect. So erosion is also um, in these pathways, and I'll just hand over to Sian to talk through that erosion aspect. Yep, thank you, Emma. Really briefly, in, in addition to the inundation modelling we've looked at, we've undertaken coastal erosion modelling. And this modelling work's been based on actual data, so the profiles, the measurements that are taken across the beaches over a number of years. So it's basis for it is the same data that's been used in the past and you'll see that the the black line on this map here is the actual um line included in the in the district plan in terms of the current erosion line that was predicted based on that 2009 work and that actually aligns quite closely with the first erosion line we've predicted um in the short term and then there's uh, predictions for if, if sea level was to rise and a 100-year storm event was to occur, where the erosion line would, would get to, would retreat back to into Tapuru if there wasn't a defence there. And so what we're proposing is that sediment recycling is undertaken. So the sediment that's coming down the river um, and onto the onto the fan delta where the river uh, exits, that sediment can be moved down and across the beach and can help build up the height of the beach to provide protect protection against that erosion in the short term. Then if the defence option is advocated for by the people in Tapuru in the longer term, the defence against inundation would also provide protection for or a defence against the coastal erosion. Thank you, Emil. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, and I guess the, the last bit that, that Sean probably didn't mention is that if a defence isn't advocated, then both the erosion challenge and the inundation challenge may be addressed through um, relocation if there wasn't a defence protection option implemented. Um, so that, that applies pretty much to both both the uh, north and the south in terms of those um, erosion aspects and the flood protection aspects. And then there's just after, after this point, there's uh, a slide where we talk about how to provide feedback 
Um, and one of the more immediate ways to provide feedback is to put things into the chat right, right now. Um, if you think um, the protection option is, is something that should be advocated for, or if it uh, looks unaffordable and doesn't look feasible in terms of the amount of ratepayers that might have to um, pay for that, um, we want to hear all that kind of feedback right now, or there are a couple of other ways um, to do that as well. But um, both feedback and um, questions or um, clarifications on what we've just provided uh, are welcome at this point. Thanks, Eamon. We have a few more comments in the thread, um, and I will um, come to one of those in a minute. But I just encourage anyone else that is listening that if Eamon's talked about anything and you weren't quite sure what he meant, or there's anything you've seen that you would like clarified while we have somebody right here to, to talk to you about it, um, no question is too simple or dumb. Um, we're here to make sure that you understand what um, we're trying to present. So do feel free to um, ask anything you like. Um, in the thread. One of the comments, uh, well, several of the comments, um, again from the same person, Eamon, really just questioning, I guess, the intent of all of the comments is really, is what we are discussing and talking about really necessary? Um, and I think it comes back to the first comment around, are we being alarmist um, in terms of what's being discussed, how it's being modelled and what's being proposed? Um, pro probably the the thing that is most valuable in terms of making the tr transition um, least uh, costly and less impact on people and society is time. Um, and so by doing this work uh, now, even though we haven't had the sea level rise that's predicted at this stage, you're actually allowing a lot more time and a lot more time to transition or time to, to pay for things um, or make decisions that um, reduce future costs. Um, so doing this work um, is, is really important and in terms of the overall, reducing the overall impacts on places like Tupuru and right around the district. Um, so definitely, uh, not alarmist. Um, we we do take uh, uh, an approach that um, takes on board recommended uh, best science and recommendations. So, if the MFE says um, Ministry for Environment guidance says that using 8.5 as the sea level rise scenarios is the appropriate level, we we do do that. Um, but also, the MFE guidance allows that pathway approach and the triggers that if those things don't happen, um, at least we're prepared um, and we understand what we might need to do in the future. Um, so hopefully that, that covers off that. Um, You've just frozen, Eamon, so we'll just give you a minute to see if you can maybe get your camera working again. Connie, can I suggest while Amon's frozen that if Rick's still there, the question uh, here, can you clarify who pays for what ends up being agreed? I think Rick can cover that. Perfect. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, thanks. Um, I see Amon's back, but I, I can I can probably help with that as well. So in terms of who pays for what, it's likely you know that the funding regime hasn't been. Uh, you know, hasn't been finalised. That's still a lot of work to understand who pays for what. But based on how regional council funds, say, the stock banks on the, and the flood protection at Te Puru, is that it's a mixture of of a, of a general rate that that's from uh, the the region. Uh, in the case of Te Puru, with the flood protection work, there's also a, a portion of um, the rest of the Coromandel is part of the Peninsula project as well. And then there is the targeted rate where people who get the most benefit from a protection um, pay the most for it. So there's a combination of funding streams in terms of who would pay for a particular um, you know, seawall if, if, that, if that is the decision that, that is made. Um, but obviously there are different benefits that people get. So obviously people in Te Puru will get a direct benefit. However, there are people who 
come to visit Tipuru or come to um, you know come, come to drive through Tipuru, they'd also get a, a potential benefit as well. So it's trying to trying to bring those people who get those indirect benefits um, to be able to to share some of those costs as well. So yeah, just to clarify, no one no one has 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 um, confirmed those funding mechanisms, but generally it's those people who get the most benefit pay the most. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. I, I think I'm back. I'm not sure if it was a, a Wi-Fi connection or something uh, from my end. Uh, but any anything else I can help with before we get to the feedback? Um, just one further question from within the comments thread is, um, why does point four become the trigger? Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting question, and it, it is mostly because that is uh, when the risk starts to be intolerable in terms of we expect significant damage um, in, a, in a, a, a big event when these 0.4 metres sea level rise. Um, underneath, underneath that, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll touch on the, um, I'll go to our website to show you where there is other information. Um, we haven't just looked at the big 100-year event. We've also looked at 20-year uh, events and king tide events, and we've, through the coastal panels, tried to think about what is tolerable for the community. Um, and alongside that, I suppose the point four is also considered a relatively inexpensive option if we were to do short-term protection, um, a protection to buy us time and then look to transition in the longer term. However, it, we haven't done a detailed design based on point four. Um, and if we did a detailed design, um, considering if point six was more appropriate, um, would be part of that, that study. So we feel that point four is okay, um, but there would be further work to to kind of um, confirm if it's the right approach. So feedback, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. So right now, Teams Chat, you've been doing that throughout the um, presentation, so that's that's great, good to get that. Um, sending an email to our, our coast site is uh, really good as well. So if, because you, you're focused on Tapuru, you put Tapuru in the um, subject heading, and put down your thoughts into a, uh, our coast um, at tcdc.govt.nz. So we'll collate the information, um, take it back to our coastal panels and probably our governance, um, and when they make the final decisions to either ch influence the change of, of pathways or approach or to confirm that what we ha are showing is, is what is uh, one of the, the better options. Um, and then we've got the tool. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. I was going to show the um, website generally. So hopefully this comes up for me. Um, so I think I'm, I'm sharing my screen. You're probably just seeing It looks like I'm having a connection. No, it's not too bad. So a lot of this information can all be found at our website, tcdc.govt.smp. So when you go there, um, uh, most recent information about these online meetings is there. Um, you've got the hazard um, posters down the side with the adaptation pathways in them and there is a link to the feedback tool. Um, but I mentioned just before that we haven't just done the 1% AEP. Um, there's a video that kind of summarizes some of the engagement, community engagement we've been doing. That's that, that bit there. And then as you get to here, there is um, some information just try and find the link, there it is, um, that you can look at the, 
the different scenarios. So what what five percent or twenty year event looks like, and um, what king tide events look like at those various twenty centimeter increments. So that's the information that we've um, looked at closely to see how bad the inundation is, how frequent different types of storms are, to start to get a feel of what of that point for what's acceptable in terms of the amount of risk and where we need to uh, do take action. Um, so that information can be here under important additional resources. I will come back up here just so you've got some context context of where to find the other feedback tool and then I'm going to hand over to Sean who's going to talk quickly through the how to use that feedback tool. The feedback tool is good because it has all the district's information um, and I'll I'll let Sean explain it. Thank you. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. So if you click on the link that Amon was just hovering over on the website, it takes you to this page here, which is this um, Coromandel Coastal Adaptation Community Consultation tool. And it allows you to share your thoughts. There's a home page and it basically um, describes to you how to use this tool and how to leave a comment. Uh, it, it has these instructions, uh, has some prompting questions in terms of things you might like to do uh, and provides details. But the crux of it is in the map that you can go to, which is this other toggle here. Again, it repeats the instructions and then it takes you to a map of the coast. So it shows you the whole of the Coromandel and what it allows you to do is to select the stretch of the coast that you're particularly interested in. So, for example, if we go to Peru here, it allows you to, to select that stretch of coast. And for the stretch of coast you've selected, so here we have to Peru South, it gives you the uh, hazard information, the proposed pathway. And if you click on that link, then that provides you with a big, a full screen version of it. So you can look at it in much more detail and on a larger scale. And if you want to leave a comment, so someone here has left a comment uh, on Moan Tyree saying the school needs to be protected. You click on the add comment box. It provides you, um, you select add a feature, it provides you with a little arrow. You put that little arrow wherever you want to and you make the comment that you would like to provide to us the feed feedback on. And as Amon's already said, what we particularly want to know for this stretch of coast is in the longer term in 40 years, um, what your vision for Tapuru is. Is it a defended coastline where, you know, with a defense that could be some meters high, or is it a place that remains as the aesthetic values it has now and um, you retreat away from it? That's how it works. Thank you. Okay, I think that, that's all we. I think that's all we had in terms of the presentation. Um, I just encourage any final questions or comments, or the opportunity to provide that feedback directly. Um, definitely do that if you've got thoughts uh, right away. Um, and any comments uh, is is good. We will look to come back to Tapuru for an in-person meeting. Um, after we've done another iteration of what these pathways look like. So we'll take on comments from today and 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 work through those with the coastal panel to see what changes we may need to make. Um, and then we'll we'll come back for a, a feed, final feedback before we, we go to the um, governance for adopting. Um, adopting is a significant milestone, um, gives us direction on where we're going, but it isn't the end of the work that's required. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time out this evening. Um, I do recognise it's quite um, confronting and a challenge. So I, I, I sympathise with, with the challenge that we've all got, um, but hopefully the work can, can help with this challenge. And I think doing this work will put us in a far better position than having not, not done it at all. So thank you everyone. Um, have a good evening and we look forward to seeing you again.